Just depends on how much time we got. I, I, we'll likely have time. Okay. But, okay. No, no, I'm not going to. That's true.
And we are going to go ahead uh, and get started. Please, people, keep on coming in. I've asked Brian May. Robert's not going to be here tonight, so I've asked Brian May uh, to open us in a prayer. But before we begin, are there any uh, prayer requests? watching her really closely. She's back on uh, oxygen, but not a bed. So that's uh, good. No news today, so that's a good sign too. So, but that's just continuing on. Um, but my sister-in-law got really good scan results and blood work results uh, this past week. So that's Fantastic. A, that's a thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Any others? Yeah, um, I don't know that I have all the up-to-date information. If somebody else does, hop in. We I heard middle of the day that um, she had some sort of complication and got put into ICU and that she was doing better, uh, but that was the last I heard. Craig, did, um, you, that's all you know. Have you heard anything, Brian? Yeah, they just said you could jump this on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on in. We got plenty of seats up here, and as Brian already pointed out, it's safe to sit on the aisle. I'm not going to walk up to you like Robert does. So, that's right. She did too. She's recovering well at Madison. Okay. Any any others? Any others? We we yeah. We we. Do you have any more information on her? We just heard she got admitted to ICU. She was doing better, but she was in ICU. She kind of bottomed out earlier in the day, and uh, they don't know if it was a medication mixed up or whatever. She was unresponsive, and that's what led to moving her to ICU so they could watch her better. Okay. Any any others? So quite a few right now. Uh, quite a few dealing with some some physical ailments. Any, if there's any others, if not, uh, Brent, do you have one or yeah. Brian? Okay. Father, we're thankful for the day that we've had, for the opportunity that we've had to serve you and serve others. Thank you for the time that we had to be here now in class and study from your word. We pray, Father, that you will be with David and be with us as we receive the things that he's prepared. Pray that we'll leave here stronger uh, for being here. Father, we pray that uh, you will be with Davy Ellie. Uh, she's developed a cold. We pray, Father, that it will not be harmful to her. We pray that um, she will be able to heal quickly and recover and to continue uh, the positive path that she has been on. Father, we are also thankful for the good news that Kay received on her scan and the results and just pray that you'll continue to be with her. Pray that you will continue to heal her body, Father, from, uh, from the disease that she has. Father, we're thankful that uh, Teresa Brody's surgery was successful and we pray now that you will watch over her um, as she's had some complications today. We pray that you will heal her body again, Father, and we pray that you'll uh, be with her family as they uh, watch over her and take care of her. Father, for Sue Passon, we also ask for healing. Um, as she's recovering from her surgery, she'll have to uh, stay in the hospital for a few days and just pray that you will uh, keep her comfortable and, and allow her to return home as quickly as possible. Father, we're thankful that Amelia Daly was able to, uh, or will be able to go home today uh, after being taken to the hospital. Um, she's been in and out a lot, and we just pray, Father, that you, again, will comfort her and be able to heal her body of the ailments that it's facing right now. Father, we're thankful for this avenue of prayer that we have to speak with you. Uh, we just pray, Father, that you'll continue to be with us as we study from the book of Matthew, and we pray that we'll all be uh, able to take something away, Father, and better be able to serve you and our brothers and sisters. 
We're thankful for Jesus. It's through Him that we ask this prayer. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Um, so to begin, uh, I want to address a couple of things. First off, uh, I purchased this shirt deliberately, and I selected it to wear tonight deliberately, okay? It makes me feel good. Um, uh, secondly, uh, I literally have been talking all day, have been on my feet uh, all day. Uh, and so if tonight's class is, you know, I don't know, slow or it doesn't go well, I just, and I mean this sincerely, please, please blame Robert, okay? <laughs> He's not here, and I don't know, it's his fault, okay? Um, so uh, anyway, wanted to get those things out of the way. Um, I actually wanted to, uh, something um, popped up on my phone uh, the other day, um, and wow, okay, there we go. I was able to get it back. Uh, this was something that was published on April 12th, so just a few days ago. Um, and I want to go back to something I talked about a few weeks ago, which is anxiety. Uh, and this um, article came up uh, that says, uh, the title of it is, if you're interested in it, and if you type this into Google, it will take you right to this article. It says, Church Attendance Slump caused mental health crisis, Harvard professor uh, suggests. And there's this hard, Harvard professor named Tyler Vanderweel, uh, and he had uh, done a, um, a, a study where he was looking at mental health data. Uh, and so I wanted to, to read uh, a couple of excerpts from that, which was, I think, very, very interesting. It says, um, the quote from the study is, Extrapolations from the nurses' health study data suggest that about 40% of the increasing suicide rate in the United States from 1999 to 2014 might be attributed to declines in attendance at religious services during this period. Another su study suggested declining attendance from 1991 to 2019 accounted for 28% of the increase in depression among adolescents, okay? And that was one quote. Uh, further down uh, in the study, it, it says, a major 2022 systematic review in the Journal of the uh, American Medical Associated documented 215 studies, each with sample sizes over 1,000 participants using longitudinal data to evaluate the relationship between religion and health. The evidence from meta-analyses, large longitudinal studies, including from Harvard's own nurses' health study, and handbooks providing more extensive documentation suggests that weekly religious service attendance is longitudinally associated with lower mortality risk, lower depression, less suicide, better cardiovascular disease survival, better health behaviors, and greater marital stability, happiness, and purpose in life. Um, it's a rather long article, didn't want to go into all of it, uh, but it is, it is uh, interesting. They go on to point out, for those of you who are uh, mathematicians, this shows only a correlation. It would be an inverse correlation, but it only shows a uh, correlation, uh, not causation. Uh, but I did think it was uh, uh, very, very interesting, and there are some other uh, um, professors and psychologists that comment uh, in uh, the, uh, the study. One of them is a gentleman by the name of uh, Jonathan Haidt. If you are ever around me, you hear me quote him some. He's, he's somebody that, that I actually have read one of his books, and uh, it's really, really interesting. So I just thought it was interesting, and like I said, it popped up on my phone this week, and since I had talked about anxiety a few weeks ago, uh, I just thought I would bring that up. Any, any thoughts on that before we move on? Okay, so I want to go back now. We're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter uh, 13. Uh, and my goal tonight is to get us the rest of the way through uh, uh, chapter 13. We may go into chapter 14. Um, chapter 13, we'll be finishing out uh, the parables uh, that are in chapter 13. And basically chapter 14, uh, the first part of it that, that I might be able to get to tonight uh, talks about uh, the death uh, of John uh, the Baptist. So uh, last week uh, we went over 
Uh, let's see, we had uh, the start about the parables. We talked about what the word parable means. Does anybody remember that? I want to do a little bit of review. Does anybody remember what parable means? What? To cast alongside. Um, I also want to take a detour here. I meant to say this as well. Last week when we were done, I mentioned, you know, I thanked everyone for saying nice things to us at the end of class. And last week, without any explanation, I dismissed class. Siegfried stood up. He looked at me and said, nice things, and turned and walked from the, <laughs> from the room. And it took me a minute, but I was like, that man held that joke. He's smiling. Somebody write that down. He's, I may have actually gotten a chuckle. Wow, if class tanks tonight, at least I got Siegfried to smile. Yeah. Uh, this is where I need. When I refer to what you do, execution comes to mind because I've lost. I've lost. Wow. Uh, can we do another prayer? I don't know. Something. I, okay. <laughs> what was I even talking about? Um, I said, what does parable mean? And it's to lay alongside, right? Or to set, set beside. Um, we we talked, about, uh, talked about that in the first uh, part of the chapter. Um, and then we talked about uh, uh, the, the, different, the different parables. We actually jumped around a little bit. We started with the sower uh, and then the parable about the weeds. And we jumped down to where, um, you know, those uh, were explained. And we did talk about as well, sort of a, a theme that, that Robert and I had talked about, which is so many times uh, in Scripture when Jesus is asked a question, how does He respond? With a question, right? And we, we talked about that. We talked about that a lot over the last couple of weeks and why um, that is effective. Um, last week... Uh, again, I want to hit on, and I know, know Craig uh, had, had the Scripture uh, reference for, for the power of the Word, and I definitely want to say, you know, uh, again, one of the points uh, I want to make, you know, from last, last week, or remake from last week, is, you know, let's not deny the power of the Word, right? When we are asked difficult questions or we're in difficult situations, opening the Word, or maybe not even answering, but just saying, you know, here, here, read this. Um, it's it's so so powerful, okay. Um, and and finally, I want want to add something in as well. Uh, this and this is not a joke. It may sound like a joke, but uh, more and more as I teach classes now now classes, I'm not talking about sermons, okay. But as I teach classes, I do try to minimize the amount of PowerPoint uh, that I do, okay, because I want I want the class to be less a presentation, more a discussion. Um, that sort of thing, and I want to encourage all of you guys that that uh, and a lot of people in here are teachers. Okay, uh, as you're doing your teaching, uh, if you're not careful, okay, you can use your PowerPoint as a crutch and not actually be teaching. Uh, and I'll I'll be honest, Barry Smith was the one that worked with me a lot on that. He he taught me that. Uh, so again, all that just goes back to. Um, what I'm trying to say is don't always be worried about, you know, the slick, polished presentation, especially in personal evangelism. Let the Word speak for itself and let the Word uh, have power. Okay? And again, Brandon, if you weren't in here, I wouldn't address it, but that is not a shot at what our, our ministers do with the presentations and the screens. That is not what I'm doing. I was talking about... He's... <laughs> <laughs> He's leaving. He's leaving. All right. So. Okay. Yes, this is not, and that's a, that's a that's a very good point. And I also think uh, you know, thank you for saying that, David, because uh, so many times uh, when you know when we are trying to evangelize, that's what we'll do, right? Is we'll we'll, we'll go to preaching. And having a preacher in here, those are different things. Uh, you agree, Brandon? So they're very different things. Okay. 
So then uh, we went through uh, those parables, and I believe the last one uh, that we looked at, I mentioned very briefly uh, the mustard seed and the yeast. Does anybody remember kind of what I, what I finished out, uh, the, the, what I took away from the mustard seed uh, and the yeast? Did we not? Okay, I'm, I'm getting strange looks, so we will go back and we will do the mustard seed uh, and the yeast. Okay, so, um, and, and we're, I'm, there is a reason I'm doing this at the end of the class. I want to want to talk about something else that I took away from this uh, progression. So, uh, last week, we did talk about the weeds among the wheat. And then starting in verse 31, and I'll go ahead uh, and read these next two parables. And then I'll ask you guys uh, for your thoughts. So verse 31, starting in verse 31, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a person took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three seda of flour until it was all leaven. So what do you guys take away from those parables? What's the, the moral, let's say, of those, of those parables? create more people, tell more people about the gospel, then that's that's what's going to give the increase to the more. Absolutely. Any other thoughts there? Yes? Started in Jerusalem, but by 60 AD was past Rome in that direction. Probably the other direction. Okay. Craig? When you think about the statement, uh, straight is the way, there is a path, and few there be that find it. Um, to me, this is as much about the strength and the enduring nature of the church as it is the size, the physical size of it. And um, I have a series of, I have a couple of audio files that uh, Dr. Kenny Barfield did over at the church where I grew up in Killen. And he, he basically talks about the history of the church all the way from current day, all the way back to the first century, and shows evidence of the existence of the church all the way through that. And you can't really say that about, you know, a, a lot of the things that you, you can go up and down the road right. here and find um, that that doesn't, that there's not a trace directly back to that. So the enduring nature of the church, being that's the, the tree that's there for years and years and years, is, is uh, to me interesting. I I agree with 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 all that. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Okay. I I will tell you, and this is one of the things I'm going to get to at the end here. I begin to see a pattern in what in these parables. That Jesus is teaching. What did he? What did he start off with? He started off with so. Then he hits the the weeds, and now he's talking about a plant uh, that's that's growing. Now the the next parable is the leaven, right? I, personally, I think it's both of those parables have essentially the same same meaning, and we'll get we'll get to that toward toward the end. Now, I want to hit verse uh, 34 and 35 uh, again. Uh, and verse 34 and 35 say, all, things, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and He did not speak anything to them without a parable. This was so uh, that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. I will open my mouth in parables. I will proclaim things hidden since the foundation of the world. Now, I read those two verses out because do you remember when we started... Uh, the study of Matthew, what was important to Matthew? 
or what did Matthew do a lot of in his book? Do you guys remember? I said he did, we said he did more of this in Matthew than the other gospels combined. Does anybody remember? Old Testament references. So this was again a callback to the Old Testament and explicitly saying, okay, this is why that happened, and this is in uh, fulfillment uh, of prophecy. So now last week, uh, we, we did do uh, the explanation of the weeds. So uh, it said, you remember, uh, he spoke that to the crowd, and then we said, uh, it said he left the crowd, and he went in the house, and the disciples came to him and ask him what it meant. He explained it. I'm not going to go over that again. And then we get to uh, a parable of uh, the hidden treasure and uh, the costly, uh, costly pearl. That's going to be verses 44 through 46. Would somebody read those? Those three verses. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, just like I did with the last parable, I'll give it to you guys. What's the, what's the meaning of this parable? And uh, something that, that we talked, I don't know that we said this in the class, but uh, Robert and I talked about it. Um, a lot of these parables have can have multiple meanings, okay? They really can. Uh, and so uh, when I'm asking, I'm not, in my mind, I don't have a this is the set answer. Um, but, but what do these two, what, what do you think these two mean? Well, I'm going to jump to the pearl because I don't know how many times I read that. You just, yeah, the kingdom of heaven is very valuable, treasure, and then costly pearl. But in that one, the kingdom of heaven is doing the searching. The church is doing the searching. We are the pearls. That's the way I look at that. Is the kingdom of heaven is looking for people of great value, or maybe all people have great value, but we, we're the pearls that are sought after. That's, I've never thought of that that way. But as I read it, I definitely, yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts there? Yeah. seems to be that he didn't even want uh, the wisest people who thought they were wise anyway to see these things. And so it, it took some interesting <coughs> humbling but also some it's apt, I agree completely. Um, and you know, that, that makes me think back to, we said this a couple of weeks ago and then I had a conversation with somebody, it may have been somebody in this room, uh, I, don't, I don't remember who it was, but we were talking again about how people come to know the truth. And I think, you know, for much of my not life, rather naively, the way I thought of it, it's, you know, me working with somebody and, and you know, kind of pulling them along. But what we actually see, and if you were the person I was talking to, give me a nod. I don't remember who said it, uh, but somebody said, you know, there's always, anytime people are searching for the truth, there's always an aspect of time, you know, that, that there's got to be presentation of the truth and it's got to sink in. And I think a lot of times uh, when we are trying uh, to sow seed and when we are trying uh, to evangelize, we get caught up in the end and we need to realize that that there is a journey uh, to that, and part of that journey uh, is time. Okay, any other thoughts on those two parables? I, uh, I found that it was interesting that Jesus kind of covered both bases uh, in this regard with uh, with the treasure being hidden in the field. It's what we would consider an accidental find. He finds it by accident. Um, and then in 45, 
like you mentioned, the merchant that's in search of the fine, of the fine pearl. Um, so no matter which way you come to know the truth, the importance is that both came to the realization that it required everything that they had, and they sold everything that they had to get that treasure. That's absolutely fantastic. Both of those. Thank you all uh, so, so much for pointing, pointing those out. Um, any other thoughts there? Constantly seeking us out. So I think there's a correlation there with the fact that God gave up His only Son, and He's constantly seeking us out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you know, something that uh, uh, I know Amanda and I actually talk about a lot is, um, and I don't know if this is a contemporary thing or if I'm showing my age here or not, but you know, you, you I remember some commercial. You know, you can have everything. And Amanda and I always talk, you know, no, everything has a cost. Everything you do, every opportunity you take, you know, there's going to be a cost for that. And I think that's a, that's a very valid point. Sometimes the cost is, extreme, you know, it's an extreme cost. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we'll, and again, we'll talk about it as we finish out the lesson tonight. What does it say in verse 46? What did uh, the merchant who was seeking, what did he give up to get the pearl? Everything. He gave it all up for for that. Excellent points. Excellent points. Any others? Okay. Um, I'm going to move on uh, to uh, the dragnet. I'll uh, read this one. And this is verses 47 uh, through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they pulled it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and remove the wicked from among the righteous, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Does this parable sound familiar? Does it sound a little bit like the one previous, right? The one about, about the weeds. Right? And again, it's one um, that's talking uh, about uh, the end times. Okay, so this is the point I was wanting to get into tonight and where I've got maybe uh, a, a little, little bit different uh, take on this, this chapter uh, as I studied for, uh, for this class. Verse 51, Jesus asks a question and He says, have you understood all these things? And they said, yes. Okay? Now, as I read that, I do not know why, but this time, as I studied, the all these things really stuck in my mind. And I really started thinking about what does he mean about all these things? And I went back and I read, uh, read the chapter again. And so where, what I took away from this is that this entire chapter, and this is just my opinion, okay? This may be, this may be totally off base, and if I'm off base, somebody jump in here. But as I, I, I read it, he has laid out, in, in my opinion, he has kind of laid out a, a Christian walk, right? What did he start with? What's he tell them? What are you going to be doing? You're going to be going and sowing, right? So you're going to be you're going to be teaching people, okay? So uh, uh, interestingly, verse another point I took away as I studied, verse twenty three says, let me see if I can get to it. Verse twenty three says uh, it's talking about the good soil. It, it says uh, the one who hears the word and understands it understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces. Some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times as much. Okay, so again, he's talking about the sowers and then how they produce fruit. It brings to my mind uh, something that I used to. There was a Bible teacher when I was in college that used to say, "You can't go to heaven alone." 
you got to take somebody with you. And I, I always uh, liked uh, like that saying. Uh, but so we start with there's sowing. Then the very next uh, uh, the very next parable we look at uh, is the weeds, which is very similar to uh, the net. Do you guys kind of remember? Um, Kind of remember what what I said a couple of weeks ago. What I took away from the one about the weeds. So we sow, who reaps? Who? That is an excellent answer. I like the way you said that. He said, "Not us." So I think acceptable answers there would be the Lord, Jesus, the angels, you know, depending on how you, how you look at the parable. But what I said uh, last week and what I take away from this is, again, he started and he says, you're to go sow. Then the very next parable, he says, now don't you worry about the weeds that are in, in among. Don't you worry about that. I've got that, right? It's, this is what I take, Dave's paraphrase, Again, if I'm wrong, uh, please jump in. And he says, "I'm uh, gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna take care of that. I'll take care of separating the good and the bad. In the end, I'll take care of that." Um, and then the very next parable is what the mustard and the yeast. And you know what I take away from that? He says, "Y'all do a little bit, and I'll do the rest." Okay. So we're going to do a little bit. He's going to provide uh, the increase. Uh, and then we go to, to the two uh, uh, parables about uh, treasure. And what I take away from that is he says, and it's going to cost you. Some of you, it may cost you everything. Okay? So I feel like, and I'm not taking this from a commentary or anything, it's just my own reading of it. I feel like, this is a narrative. So he had had these different parables that he's giving out, and each one of those parables has one or more meanings. But in the end, when he's asking, "Do you understand all this?" You know, and and I skipped one parable because I feel like it's it's kind of back in there with the weeds. It's it's also interesting to me, and I couldn't quite couldn't quite get my head around how it fits. But he does the the treasure part. And again, he says it, it's, it may cost you everything. And then he goes back to the reaping, right? He goes back to, you know, there's going to be a separation. The good and the evil are going to be separated uh, and, the, and the bad will be, be thrown away. So that was what I took away uh, from uh, that, that entire chapter. And that will um, take us all the way through uh, chapter 13 down to verse 51. Any questions or comments? Getting up there and saying, I think that's just where he's saying uh, it's something that you have to give up everything and go get it. Because if you keep anything for yourself, then you're not you're not going to be able to afford right. to become a Christian. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other comments? Yeah, Brandon. Another Jesus began with a story right, that they could connect with on an earthly level. But then he goes back and quotes Isaiah and says, hey, there's going to be some people who are going to hear the words I'm saying, but they're not going to catch it. So to me, like, he's, he sort of tells them that, and now they know to look for something deeper. And so as he continues on these other things, and I love how you address that as a, as a sense of like a Christian life almost. So you gotta you got to understand that I do the work. You got to understand that I'm the one who judges. You really have one role, and it's not to distinguish between any of those kinds of souls. It's everything and everybody. But then ultimately, it, it's worth the effort. That that to me is the, one of the biggest things that jumps out of it. So when he's looking at them, asking them if they understand, he's saying, "Do you capture what is being expected of you?" I, I always think back to when Jesus says, "No servant is greater than his master." And what he means by that is if I suffer, you'll suffer too. There's there's cost involved, but it's worth everything. 
to me that's that's an awesome that whole that whole chapter is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Thank you very very much uh, for that. And I, I agree completely with with everything uh, you were saying there. So I want to talk uh, just briefly, and then then we'll have to finish up. Um, does Christianity cost us anything today? This was not something I planned to do. I just does it? I think it's supposed to. It's supposed to. Okay. Why do you say that? I think that. Well, that's like most of what this is saying, right? Like. That's a great answer, by the way. <laughs> that is a great answer. Like in so. the treasure, like if you don't give up everything, I mean, and you don't have some sort of cost that you're laying everything that you're supposed to give up down of who you are. You're not going to be able to be fully filled with, you know, yeah. and be who you're supposed to be. Yeah, I think I think that's that's very very true. Any other thoughts there about the cost? In Luke fourteen twenty six, Jesus is talking, starting in verse twenty seven. He says, "Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple." So the fact that you have to bear something in indicates a cost. And then he goes on verse twenty eight and says. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let, let me ask a different question. Let me change change gears on you. Do we expect it to cost us anything? In today's society, do we expect it to cost us anything? So, so let me let me throw something else else out, and hopefully, because I feel like I see some people who want to say something, but maybe they're concerned too. I'm going to take the stance that no, we don't expect it to cost anything. Anybody got a got a thought there? I'm not saying that that's not, what I'm trying to say is that we just, I feel like we've simplified Christianity to the point where we have, you know, maybe not let it permeate as much of our lives or let it cost as much as we should. We don't give as much of our time. We have too many things that kind of eat up at our time. We have a problem, you know, allowing Jesus to, to really feel... Um, fill us up because we're so full of ourselves and our time and the things that we do. I think that's a very good answer. Any other thoughts there? Larry. Uh, that kind of takes us back to Matthew 6 where Jesus was talking about being concerned about what we'll eat, what we're uh, wearing, and all those things. And he ends up saying, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And in, in our case, where we're not having to make daily sacrifices a lot of times, uh, it's easy to slip that first into second or third or fourth or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, if you look at Luke 12, 31, I love this. I love that reference because Luke 12, 31 is the companion sermon to the one in Matthew 6. And it says, if I can find it here, uh, Jesus is doing the speaking here. And in, in comparison to what he says in Matthew 6 uh, about seeking first the kingdom of God, if you read the English Standard Translation of Luke 12, 31, it says instead seek his kingdom. It's not a priority. It is a replacement, right? So when you're talking about costing everything, that, that translation of it says you're replacing what you want with what Jesus wants. I think we have one more comment, and I'm going to have to move on. Siegfried? I don't have a scripture right now of 
when I hear, thank God, we live in a country where we can worship without fear of persecution. To me, that is not a good statement. Why? Hey, it doesn't, it's, it's easy. There is a persecution. We're being persecuted. We take it for granted or we just, we don't realize the persecution. We don't realize the struggle, the cost and everything. Whenever we take something for granted, we will lose it. To the guys I say about the freedom, hey man, you took it for granted, right? You lost it. You need to understand the cost, the value, how precious. But when we say, you know, hey, we're, we, without fear of persecution, if you don't think there's persecution, you don't understand. But, but the, other, the other side of that coin is, is that cost is not just persecution. Cost is giving up yourself for the other person. Taking time that you could go do something for yourself and giving it to the other person. Yeah. There's cost, there's, I call it positive cost, if you want, you know, that, that, that you have to lay aside something for somebody else. Yes. You know? And it, I think you are both right. I'm, my point is not cost and persecution. Right. I'm equating that. I'm saying persecution when we have that attitude. Right. We trivialize or we don't realize that that's cost. I'm like, I didn't really address that type of cost. Yes. Absolutely. So I appreciate the, the, the comments. I would love to keep doing this, but um, I, want, I do want to finish out. Uh, the rest of the chapter. So uh, verse 52, just very quickly, um, when I read verse 52, um, I stopped because something about it made me stop. I said, and it says, and Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of household who brings out of his treasure new things and old. And I, for like a couple of minutes, I was like, what does that mean? And then it hit me. Uh, what did the scribes have? They were literally transcribing the old law. So they knew the old law. And then he's saying the ones of those that understand, right, they're bringing treasure out of the old and they understand the new. So that's what, what that was. Uh, verse 53 through 57, there was a phrase there. It's talked, it talks about where he's gone back uh, to Nazareth uh, and he is there. Uh, and he's teaching, and they're not happy with him. Uh, it's kind of interesting to me. It says they took offense at him. And when you look at what he was doing in verse 53 to verse 56, why would that be offensive? Okay, uh, that's the question I had. And then uh, it was also uh, interesting to me, uh, verse uh, 58, uh, it says... Uh, in the translation I'm looking at, which I believe is the New American Standard, it says, yes, I'm New American Standard. It says, let me get back to it. He did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And uh, in Mark 6, 5, this same story, it's interesting to me that it says he could not do miracles because of their unbelief. And I've heard uh, that talk. Uh, that that uh, that was uh, don't I'm going to say a restriction. That was a restriction on his power because they didn't believe. Okay, uh, I don't know that I have a, a complete theory on that or a complete uh, um, you know lesson on that. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Um, so th with that particular uh, uh, scripture, I was going to leave it with you guys. Uh, we didn't have time, uh, but it is interesting to me. Uh, verse 55, um, it lists out Jesus' brothers. Uh, it's interesting to me because if you're familiar with Catholic doctrine, uh, they believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh and I'm not exactly sure how they get around that. I was going to have Bart and Julie perhaps talk a little bit about that, uh, but I'm guessing they would probably say those are his half brothers, and and uh, or well, they would have been Joseph's children, not of of Mary. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, that's right. They believe there was another another marriage that was was not mentioned. Uh, so anyway, uh, that was the second bell. Thank you all for your attention tonight. Robert should be back uh, next week, and please ridicule him. <laughs>